What was life like before we emerged from hunter-gatherer tribes and pulled ourselves into the civilized world? Notoriously, this same question was asked by the great philosopher Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century. His answer, the state of nature is a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, where all live in continual fear and in danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This is human nature. Left to our own devices, we are led to fight by diffidence, competition, and glory. Here our inner demons come out to play, predatory, revengeful, dominant, and sadistic. We are survival machines, but ultimately, the best way for us all to survive is to create a new machine, a great leviathan, viz. the dawn of the state. Thirty years after Hobbes' death saw the birth of his rival, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It is here, at the origin of the state, says Rousseau, where human nature is corrupted. Society is the curse of humankind. In his own words, many writers have hastily concluded that man is naturally cruel and requires civil institutions to make him more mild, whereas nothing is more gentle than man in his primitive state. According to the axiom of the wise Locke, there can be no injury where there is no property. Be sure not to listen to Hobbes the imposter. We are lost, but we can find ourselves again. In this episode, we'll be discussing the views of Hobbes and Rousseau with returning guests Stephen Pinker and Rutger Bregman. Stephen Pinker, professor of psychology at Harvard University, is one of the leading thinkers in the field. Stephen has an extraordinary list of accomplishments and awards, considered by many, including Foreign Policy and Time magazine, to be amongst the 100 most influential people in the world today. Historian and author Rutger Bregman is acclaimed for his best-selling book, Utopia for Realists, and How We Can Get There. Described by The Guardian as the Dutch Wunderkind of new ideas, and by Ted as one of Europe's most prominent young thinkers, Bregman's vision of and for humankind is a call to rethink our understanding of the past and our vision for the future. Coinciding with the rise of the Homo sapien, this might be the oldest and most important philosophical question. What is human nature? Hello and welcome to episode 80 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the blank slate, that is Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the man throwing away his Timex as he pulls away on his motorcycle to find America, Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. <laughs> Constantly pausing sad movies on flight so passengers don't feel the need to comfort him, it's Rutger Bregman. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> And you can find him rope climbing on the weekend, suspended above the floor like a clump of seaweed on a fishing line, Professor Stephen Pinker. <laughs> Hi. It's great to have you back on the show. And leading up to this episode, in the past week, me and Ali have read uh, Rutger's newly released and brilliantly written Humankind, A New History of Human Nature, as well as Steve's incredible The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. I say that with great triumph because your book, Steve, Better Angels of Our Nature, is absolutely huge. To quote Rutger himself, he says, Rutger says in his own book, it's a massive doorstep of a book with 802 pages and extra small font and packed with graphs and tables, perfect for knocking your enemies out cold. <laughs> you might say it's the perfect weapon in a state of nature. So before we begin, Steve, you've got to tell us how long it took you, research aside, just to do the writing for Better Angels. It took about 17 months of uh, intensive work. I had a sabbatical, and when I write, I tend to uh, work morning, noon, and night. Uh, I become uh, obsessed with finishing a project once I begin it. Well, it's absolutely incredible, and I loved every page of it, and I'm sure Ollie and Rutger agree. But um, before we get into hearing some of those ideas, Rutger, we spoke to you back in March last year, and you mentioned your book Humankind was being prepared for translation. You said at the time it contained some of the most radical ideas out there. On the release of the book in English, how have you found the media circuit this time round, and have your ideas been well received, or are they as radical as you first thought? Well, it's just getting started. I mean, the book will be published uh, two weeks from now, so now is uh, a pretty intense time. So uh, we'll see. Apologies, I'm I'm, I'm alleviating my time bias. I know this is released <laughs> well, two weeks uh, prior from the release. You're a true so philosopher. You don't think in days. You think in like decades or like <laughs> centuries or whatever. <laughs> That's the influence of yours and Steve's the, history. The, uh, the, viewpoint, the viewpoint from eternity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indoctrinated by, uh, by Singer. Just before we get into some of these ideas, Ollie, if, um, I feel like I haven't seen you in 
10,000 years. Are you still rolling around in the dirt? Have you enjoyed the reading for today's episode? <laughs> it has been a while, Jack. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the reading for today's episode. You know, reading through the better angels and humankind has just been brilliant and it's really reminded me of one of the first uh kind of interviews we ever did on the podcast which is when we interviewed ac grayling and he said the best thing about philosophy is it gives you permission to look at different disciplines or be nosy um and you know these books are filled with history philosophy psychology biology and i've really enjoyed just being nosy and, and hopefully uh, diving into these topics in depth which we'll get the chance to discuss today i think it's going to be really good a very special thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment for supporting our Leviathan, as well as our amazing patrons over at patreon.com forward slash pansidecast. Thank you to all of our listeners who have already pledged their support. Your altruism would have Hobbes turning over in his grave. In particular, a very special thank you to the man always fighting between his inner demons and better angels. It's St. David Ligeness. Making the 21st century the most violent in history with his road rage is Mr. Dylan Kirby. If they say why, why, why over and over again, Miss Lily Hooper just tells them that it's human nature. The individual who enjoys his state of nature like he enjoys his hot beverages, nasty, brutish and short, it's Mr. T. Haunting your thoughts with the most malevolent of impulses, it's Jimmy Casperson. His moral character is so strong, he is never afflicted by the bystander effect, it's Moron van der Kolk. This human being will never blush, he's just too Adam cool. And did he survive due to being the fittest or the friendliest? It's most certainly both, Mr. Jim Clare. To celebrate this episode, we're also giving away 10 copies of Humankind and Better Angels of Our Nature. To be in with the chance of winning, head over to our social media pages, Twitter and Facebook, links in the description, or consider picking up a copy of either book. Links are in the iTunes description for them as well. We're also delighted to announce Talking About Philosophy, an upcoming series of short introductory philosophy books comprising of interviews, commentaries and short essays from the world's leading thinkers. For more information, head over to www.talkingaboutphilosophy.com or click the link in the iTunes description. Part one, humankind. Steve, one of your most influential ideas and the focus of Better Angels is that the world has become increasingly less violent throughout our history, not just in terms of wars, genocide, terrorism by suicide, infanticide, and all the other sides you note that could fill a rhyming dictionary, but for all of our rights as well. So in short, the world is much less bloodier today than it has ever been. So let's go back at least 10,000 years before the first non-state societies began to engage in agriculture, before they started going to um, estate agents and organising themselves around private property. You know, Hobbes said that life was nasty, brutish and short, but he didn't have, he was much more of a brain on a stick than you or Rutger. So with today's science, psychology and history on our side, what reason do you think that we have for thinking that Hobbes was actually uh, close to close to right with his assessment of human nature in this state? Well, H Hobbes was, was out to lunch when he said that, uh, that uh, humans were solitary. Humans were never solitary. But on the other hand, uh, uh, that was a widespread assumption that is shared, shared by uh, Rousseau. Um, uh, I, I do think that he uh, put his finger on, a, on an essential tragedy of intelligent, self-interested agents. He did not say that humans had a, uh, an atavistic thirst for blood or an innate uh, sadism. He said that, there, that any agents are inherently vulnerable to the fear exploited by others, which could lead, lead them to engage in a, a preemptive strike simply to protect themselves against that possibility, which could lead their neighbors to preemptively protect themselves uh, against a preemptive strike uh, mm -hmm. ad infinitum. Uh, that the <clears throat> best way out of that dilemma is to cultivate a reputation for a willingness to and an ability to avenge any uh, exploitative attack but that mm -hmm. in order to secure the credibility of one's deterrent means that one has to respond to any insults or affronts with violence to uh, establish the the, uh, the the credibility of the deterrent so it's it's a game theoretic <clears throat> tragic view and it is it's not one that uh, 
depends on some uh, irrational impulse toward violence. Mm -hmm. In uh, calling for a Leviathan to uh, enforce a social contract, I think Hobbes was anticipating the insight from game theory that external incentives can help secure public goods. In this case, the advantage that everyone has from refraining from violence only so long as their neighbors are incentivized from refraining from violence as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the theoretical insight of Hobbes. Uh, it was game theoretic before there was such a thing as game theory. And also, I think it, it made a um, an accurate prediction that in a, a state of anarchy, there will naturally be violent competition and uh, vengeance and feuding, not at the level of every man against every man, because humans are naturally social and we fall into families and clans, but uh, but between groups and, uh, uh, and to some extent between individuals, not every man against every man, but uh, we know from cross-cultural um, surveys that uh, rape and murder are found in all human societies, that, and that there are often uh, high levels of reading and feuding in mm. uh, human societies that don't live under the uh, aegis of a, a government authority. Uh, this doesn't mean hunter-gatherers per se, but it does. Uh, we do tend to find that in zones of anarchy, there are, including pastoralists and chiefdoms and tribes, there are often high rates of uh, raiding and feuding and high numbers of uh, death, death by violence. Mm. The state itself can uh, commit a lot of violence, but on the other hand, in preventing its um, citizens from killing each other, uh, often the overall rates of violence are lower. What Hobbes, uh, another thing that Hobbes got wrong was the idea that uh, a Leviathan could ultimately be an, a, a, an enforcer of a disinterested enforcer of a social mm -hmm. contract and uh, a or an overall force for peace and order. I think what he did not explore enough was the self-interested motives of leaders and states to perpetuate their own power. And it was only really with the rise of democracy that we were able to deal with a, a, a second form of violence, not people against other people, but the state against people. And you can mm -hmm. think of democracy as a way of solving that second problem, namely how to prevent the Leviathan from visiting uh, as much violence on its subjects as the subjects visit on each other. Well, it's phenomenal in the book, the statistics you draw, I think just one here, the overall homicide rate for the entire world is somewhere between 6 and 8.8 .8 per 100,000. And you say there's triple digits for these pre-state societies. So the, the difference is huge. And in your own research, you found this too with um, in your own internet polls, you found people today think the world is much bloodier today than it has been in the past. So is it just like the Leviathan? Because as we move to agriculture and we start to have these small city states and so on, they were pretty bloody as well. In your book, you talk about the Greek states inflicting this war or the Crusades. Like it, it's not like the, the light bulb flicks on, we've got the state and everything's fine. What else leads us to the uh, peace and lack of violence that we have today outside of the Leviathan itself? Oh, indeed. Well, um, one is the uh, the fact that we are parts of larger and larger uh, polities. So more of us feel that we are members of the same virtual uh, virtual tribe, and, and ideally that would encompass all of uh, humanity, and and for that matter, uh, other sentient agents, namely uh, animals. That hasn't ha happened yet, but it is a uh, an intermittent force. It was given. Um, uh, a push after the uh, carnage of the Second World War with the establishment of the United Nations and other organizations for international cooperation, and uh, a, a general sense that, um, th that there is such a thing as the planet, as humanity, uh, and that that, uh, that is one of the tribes that we belong to. Uh, it's abetted by technologies, if you will, that, that uh, tend to engage our sense of sympathy, the fact that we uh, have media that, that bring the rest of the world into our living rooms. We can see the faces of people who are unlike ourselves. We live in societies that are more cosmopolitan, so we rub shoulders with people who are unlike us, and we can see that they are uh, humans a, a, as we are. Uh, institutionally, we are knitted together in webs of, of bureaucracy and commerce that incentivize cooperation. 
uh, if you uh, make your living by trade, uh, then you, you don't want to kill your customers. And if it's cheaper to buy things than to steal them, then that uh, reduces the incentives, incentives mm. for plunder. Likewise, if you're part of a rule-governed institution, then uh, you don't establish esteem and prestige by uh, being the, the, the toughest badass. If you get into a, a conflict with someone, you don't say, well, how, are you, with you and me settle this outside with a, with a, a fist fight. If, if you were, you'd be hauled in front of a, a human resources department and sent out for anger management training. So the, the general uh, growth of institutions, both commercial and international, mm. uh, can also change uh, the incentives. And then finally, there's um, the, the the state, the rule of law, is one way of disincentivizing the, the motives for, uh, for, for, for violent competition. But we can look at, at uh, violence as another problem to be solved. And uh, mm. in addition to police, rule of law, uh, justice system, uh, we can set as almost a technological problem. How do we how do we keep people from each other's throats? And just as with other measures of uh, technological progress, dealing with uh, with hunger, with disease, uh, with transportation, we can develop very uh, a whole bag of tricks to reducing mm -hmm. violence, and um, uh, of which a, a court system is just one. I want to bring you in here, Rutger. So um, Stephen said so far that, you know, OK, life in a state of nature, according to Hobbes, wasn't wasn't solitary. And there's some problems with the Leviathan. But this idea of it being nasty and brutish and short seems relatively correct. But to quote your book, you say Thomas Hobbes, the old philosopher, could not have been more off the mark. He characterized the life and times of our ancestors as nasty, brutish and short. But a truer description would have been friendly, peaceful, and healthy. Um, how have you come upon such a radically different view? Well, I think that when we talk about human history, uh, the first question that we should ask ourselves is, what history are we talking about? So is it just the history mm. of civilization? Is it just the history of the past, say, 10,000 years that started when we first settled down and began agriculture and then began living in villages and cities and then, you know, the wheel came and all these wonderful inventions? Or are we looking at, say, the past 300,000 years of our existence, right? Because most of our existence, we lived as nomadic hunter-gatherers. Mm. So the question that I think we should ask is, what was life like when we were nomadic hunter-gatherers? And this is obviously the big, questions that, the big question that anthropologists and archaeologists and even philosophers have grappled with mm. for ages, right? It's also a very polemical debate because... Uh, a lot hinges on the answer, right? It's uh, It sometimes becomes a quite political debate as well, I think. Often mm -hmm. people on the left, they like a more sort of optimistic, rosy view of human nature because it seems to suggest that all their ideas suddenly become possible. But then people on the right often have a, have a sort of a darker, more Hobbesian view of human nature. So that's something to keep in mind here. But reading the latest anthropological and archaeological evidence, I, I became, well, more convinced that actually... Rousseau had a little, well, at one point I thought I should call one of these chapters Rousseau was right. <laughs> uh, because, for example, if you look at, and I think this is the most important thing, the prehistory of war, right? When did war mm. actually originate? I've become convinced that actually war had a beginning, right? And it had a beginning when people first settled down and they started doing agriculture. And before that, right. there's very little archaeological evidence for war. One important piece of the puzzle, for example, is uh, cave paintings. If you look at cave paintings, you would expect that if there really was some kind of war of all against all going on in, you know, in our deep, deep past, that at some point, you know, someone would made a nice, a nice painting or drawing of it, but mm. you can't really find it. But then after people settled down and after they started doing agriculture, um, you suddenly see a lot of those drawings. And I think this is, this is my critique here of, of the better angels of our nature, which I love, by the way, and has been a huge influence on me. Uh, also for my previous book, Utopia for Realists. Uh, but my critique here is that I think Stephen mixes up um, sort of different kinds of societies. So when we look at hunter-gatherers, I think we have to look specifically at nomadic hunter-gatherer societies and not look mm -hmm. at uh, uh, hunter-gatherer societies that also have already sort of settled down or domesticated horses or have do started doing a little of agriculture on the side because those are all really recent phenomena. You know, if you zoom out and look at the whole world history, that's just like 
started happening yesterday. So um, I think it's more reasonable to look at nomadic and together societies. And then if you look at the anthropological evidence, anthropologist Doug- Douglas Fry has done some interesting work looking at specifically this ma- no, these nomadic and together societies. And mm. yes, obviously they, they're capable of violence, but actually wars, group violence is very, very rare. And uh, it seems as if, if, if gr- groups are also much more flexible than uh, than we've often thought you know people often mm. switch uh, uh their membership or, or join a different group etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think there a very different picture emerges and then obviously i mean if we talk about you know just life in general the welfare of nomadic and togetherers i think a mm-hmm. convincing case can be made that if you would Ha, you know, uh, would have to choose. Let's assume some Rawlsian veil of ignorance, right? And you would have to choose whether you you were born in life before civilization or life after civilization. I think the rational thing to do would be to choose a life before civilization, actually, because obviously we've made extraordinary progress in the past, say, two hundred years, mm. but actually most of life in in this so-called civilized state of affairs was pretty horrible for most people, right? Most people were oppressed peasants somewhere, right? And mm-hmm. and we also know from both archaeological and anthropological evidence that the health of, of nomadic hunter-gatherers was, was, was better than that of uh, farmers and, and city people who came later. Also, infection diseases. I mean, we're now in the midst of a pandemic, um, mm-hmm. infection diseases are quite a modern phenomenon. You know, if you look at all these diseases from malaria to the plague, it's it's really a result of people living in sort of civilized societies. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm, I'm denying the extraordinary progress that Stephen writes about brilliantly and, you know, that I've written a little bit myself uh, about as well, uh, for, and especially from the last 30 to 40 years. I mean, it's just been extraordinary, the decline in child mm-hmm. mortality and an improvement in health, et cetera, et cetera. But if you really, really zoom out and t- take sort of the grander picture, then I think my view of, of human history is a little bit different. Is I, I, I see a different shape. I, I don't s- just see this sort of the uh, a line that's going up. I don't just see progress. Mm. Actually, I see initially, I think that civilization was a pretty bad idea. Just before I ask Steve to, to jump in on this, um, I didn't quite realize how different your, your views were before um, you know, it, inviting you back on reading through the books uh, with a fine tooth comb. But it, let's ignore that 10,000 date. Well, let's say that that 10,000 date for agriculture was just you know, the first move to agriculture. But obviously, different societies moved into agriculture at mm-hmm. different times. Mm-hmm. And Northern Ireland's, what, yeah. four, th- four or 6,000 years? I forget which off the top of my head. Ignore the, the fossils which... Um, or the archaeological dig sites that Steve writes about in his book um, of Lindo Man and all these other people in there. And just look at the biology of, of the human. Like the male is stronger, is taller, produces more testosterone. Isn't, isn't that an argument to say against your view that we would be expected to compete for females in a, in a state of nature mm-hmm. in, you know, in, with our ancestors as the chimpanzee mm-hmm. or something like this? Well, here's, I think, where another interesting new theory from evolutionary biology comes in. And this is the, uh, the notion of self-domestication. If you look at what's been happening to our bodies in the past 50,000 years, and, you know, archaeologists have, have sort of compared our skulls and skeletons, etc., for the past thousands of years, what you actually see is that men have become feminine, right? They More feminine uh, than they used to be. We used to look more like Neanderthals, like a bit more, how do you say this, brutish creatures. And there are biologists now that suspect that we, what we have done to ourselves is quite similar to what we have done to to cows or to you know goats, other animals that we have domesticated. Uh, another term for this that that one biologist, Brian Hare, who's been doing some really brilliant work on this, he calls it uh, survival of the friendliest, which means mm. that for thousands of years it was actually the friendliest among us who had the uh, most kids, and so also had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. So there was a real evolutionary pressure for friendliness. Then the question is, of course, what was the most important mechanism? I mean, there are some uh, evolutionary bi- biologists, for example, Richard Wrangham, just has a brilliant book out. Uh, what's it called? The Good Paradox or something? Anyway, anyway yeah, yeah. And so he argues that the most important evolutionary me- uh, mechanic here was... Uh, was a capital punishment. You know, if you were acting like Donald Trump in prehistory, people would just, the group would just kill you, basically. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was certainly, I mean, there's certainly quite some evidence again here from the anthropological uh, literature, but I would also emphasize that there are also other ways to select for friendliness. You know, maybe if there, you have a more egalitarian society, then, uh, well, maybe women just prefer to sleep with friendly men, right? And uh, maybe um, in such a society, nice guys finish first. That's a big debate I guess we'll be having in the in the next couple of years because this self-domestication theory is a really, I think it's a really powerful idea and, and the evidence is really accumulating for it. And it gives mm. us a very different picture of who we really are as a species and also it gives a very different explanation uh, for why we sort of conquered the globe. Uh, our superpower is not that we're so smart. I mean, we're clearly not. Individually, we're... You know, we're not we're not very smart. If you do an intelligence test, you know, and let a toddler compete with a pig, then often the pig wins, right? Which you should remember mm. the next time you eat bacon. But uh, you know, we're not that smart. <laughs> we're not that powerful, strong either. But we are extraordinarily good at cooperating, at working together. Mm. So I think that that st- pushes strongly against this view of human beings as being innately aggressive or violent or whatsoever. Mm. I think the opposite is actually true. So, so we start off in this um, in this friendly state of nature. Society corrupts us. Steve, how what do you think of Rutger's skepticism then of of your view that the Leviathan is our saving grace? Oh, it's not a saving not a saving grace because the, as I mentioned, uh, once you have a Leviathan keeping people from each other's throats, you've got the problem of how to keep the Leviathan from its people's throats. So mm. forget saving grace. Uh, forget also linear uh, progress. Uh, continuous improvement since for for 300,000 years. The reason that I divided Better Angels of Our Nature into chapters uh, and gave names to various developments is that our retreat from violence has not been continuous. Uh, Indeed, the uh, decline of war is historically a a recent phenomenon, which uh, I think can only be dated to after the Second World War. Whereas the decline of other forms of violence began uh, earlier. So I gave the names, the pacification process, the civilizing process, the humanitarian revolution, the the long peace, the new peace, and the rights revolutions. And and they uh, unfolded on different timescales. So let's go go back to the the data on um, on, on violence in human uh, history. Paintings uh, are are a very poor source of information about behavior of our uh, ancestors, because there just are very few paintings, especially before about 30,000 years ago. Paintings just don't, don't survive. And who knows what, uh, uh, what people decide to put in, in their, uh, their, their uh, paintings. Um, better evidence, of course, is uh, archaeological. And here, uh, there, there's pretty decisive evidence that war was not um, originated with uh, the first farmers. Uh, in particular, the study that published in uh, Nature uh, a few years ago by uh, Mirazon Lahr uh, and, and uh, Richard Foley and others of uh, a, an amazing site in uh, West Turkana in uh, Kenya, which had, um, uh, I think, a, a dozen skeletons that uh, whose skulls were bashed and, and other bones were bashed in by weapons, some of them still around, who were literally uh, tied up and bludgeoned to death. And uh, these were not farmers. Now, of course, the archaeological record for violence is necessarily sketchy because any kind of flesh wound won't be preserved in the archaeological record. Mm. But there's there's a a lot of evidence that violence did not originate with the uh, invention of farming. Probably the best survey was the one by um, uh, Jose Maria Gomez et al. that came out in Nature. Uh, a few years ago, 2016. Uh, this was after the Better Angels of Our Nature was published, but it had the most extensive survey of both the archaeological and ethnographic literatures. Far more reliable than, than Douglas Fry, who is on record as uh, ideologically motivated uh, by his own admission. In fact, I have a <laughs> quote here: uh, "If war is seen as natural, then there is little point in trying to prevent, reduce, or abolish it." So he gave a put a huge moral and political burden on this empirical mm-hmm. question. One that, by the way, I think is just backwards. Uh, mm-hmm. I 
I think that uh, whether war is natural has nothing to do with whether we can prevent, reduce, or abolish it. In fact, I would argue that mm -hmm. not only have we been successful at preventing, reducing, or abolishing it, but we have been precisely in recognition that it is a constant vulnerability and that we need active measures to prevent war, not counting on human nature to be uh, eternally uh, pacifistic. Mm -hmm. The uh, Gomez study is the most, was virtually exhaustive in terms of both the archaeological and um, ethnographic literature. And uh, it, it clearly shows that uh, that, that states are, uh, again, with, if, if you want to pose it as a Rawlsian question, if your goal was not to die at the hands of another human, then you're, you're better off in a state society. Uh, now, this is does not mean that you'd be better off as, say, a Sumerian peasant. Uh, compared to a hunter-gatherer. I think I might agree with Rutger that uh, um, for a lot of human history, mm. um, being a peasant was a pretty mm -hmm. miserable existence, um, uh, and, and being a hunter-gatherer was, uh, was, was more mixed. But the data are that uh, in the archaeological record, about three and a third percent of deaths were due to violence in tribes uh, three and a half percent in chiefdoms, which is a more um, organized um, social uh, form, although not um, state-based, is 14 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, historic archaeological data was uh, one quarter of one percent. Likewise, the ethnographic data has uh, 10 percent of deaths in bands, uh, that is hunter, mainly hunter-gatherers, about 4% in tribes and 1.3% in states, including the casualties of the, the world wars and, and, uh, and other records. Hmm. So um, uh, the, the most extensive data suggests that uh, war is not uh, an invention of agriculture and uh, it was not, we were not better off uh, in, in hunter-gatherer bands, although there was no great shakes uh, being a peasant or for mm. that matter, mm. a, a horticulturalist lifestyle. Mm. Maybe, I, maybe I should have made myself a little bit clearer. Uh, sorry if you didn't do that. I, I'm not saying that war is an inventor, invention of farmers or that it started with agriculture. I think that the argument that some of like the more optimistic archaeologists uh, and anthropologists are making is that um, it started with people settling down and becoming sedentary. And so you have hunter-gatherers who maybe don't do farming yet, but have already settled mm. down. I think also the the example that you gave from, you know, the recent finding from Kenya, that is still, you know, quite controversial. There are, there are quite some scientists who have different views on this. And there was also, you know, uh, as these things always go, you know, new comments in nature and uh, they're still discussing what it really means. But I think that if you look at the archaeological uh, evidence before we settle down, right, uh, before we became a sedentary people and also started domesticating other animals and after that, but that, you know, often took even centuries uh, after we settled down is to, to start doing agriculture. But if you really look at all the evidence that we have before that, you've, you have around 3,000 skeletons with hardly any, any evidence of, of violence whatsoever. I'm just wondering whether you look far back enough, right? Because obviously, once you already start looking at tribes or chiefdoms, then yeah, you'll find a lot of violence. But that's not the argument that's being made here, right? Because I think once you, you're talking about tribes or chiefdoms, you're already, you know, in the history of civilization. And that's exactly the point. Yeah, that, that's when it starts. So I think you have to go a little bit further. And then the evidence becomes much weaker for this sort of the more Hobbesian view of human nature. Yes, no, it absolutely becomes weaker just because of the, the paucity of, uh, of examples. But mm -hmm. it isn't, and it, the, we have to make two, dis, two there, there are two different distinctions we're talking about. One is um, nomadic hunter-gatherers versus everyone else. Mm -hmm. What's relevant to, to Hobbes' argument, he was talking about life before states. And there, um, the, the, the dividing line is not um, mobile hunter-gatherers versus everyone else. Yeah, it's yeah. one state yeah. versus State. Yeah, and I agree with you there completely. I mean, if you could, if you're already in the history of civilization, and then would again have to choose: do you want to live in a society without a state or in a society with a state? Then obviously, I mean, and th there, there's there's strong evidence that it, indeed, once the state becomes bigger, that you 
uh, and the, and sort of the front line moves, you know, and the society expands, you know. Mm. You see this with the the Pax Romana, you know, the Roman peace. Things become more peaceful. So I think that I, I completely agree with that argument. But the thing is just, I mean, we've we've been on this planet for, what is it, 300,000 years. So the ultimate question is is really what was life like for most of that period? And obviously it's the hardest question because you're absolutely right. There's, there's little evidence, even though I would be a little bit more optimistic about some things. For example, cave paintings, I think it's striking. You have, I think, hundreds of cave paintings that, that, are, that are really old and you, you find paintings of people hunting and doing all kinds of things, but you don't see this depiction of war. And then it's later and then you're in the period where we have already, you know, settled down and started doing agriculture and then you suddenly see these pictures, right? I mean, that's suggestive to me. I'm not saying it's conclusive evidence, but it is what you would expect if war had actually a beginning. Yes, yeah, so we, we've, uh, we, we've talked about the, uh, you know, whether skeletons or, or paintings would be better uh, yeah. your data. But it, it is, likewise, I think it's informative to look at uh, the extant hunter-gatherers or historically recent ones that have been mm -hmm. were mobile uh, when they were first encountered, uh, had, were free of uh, influence of, of uh, pacifying states and, and empires. And um, Australia is, is a uh, good example, as Azar Ghat the, uh, mm -hmm. points out. Aboriginal Australians were separated from the rest of humanity for uh, in the order of uh, 50 or 60,000 years. Um, they were not particularly sedentary. Uh, but when the Europeans arrived, there was a, a, an a, a awful lot of, uh, of warfare. Mm. Now, again, this is uh, one of the reasons this is such a contentious issue is the one that, that I think the, the confusion that Douglas Fry made, namely that let us hope and pray that uh, our ancestors did not engage in violence, because then we have the optimistic hope that we can uh, abolish war. Now, I do think we can abolish war. I think we're actually getting pretty close. We, we've almost abolished a war between nations. Mm -hmm. Not quite, but we're very close. Mm -hmm. But we've done it because we have recognized the, the, um, the, the threat. We've put into place institutions such as the United Nations, uh, crim uh, international law, a regime that encourages uh, commerce and trade, the propagation of norms of uh, nonviolence and peaceful cooperation. So we, we've, we've treated it as a problem to be solved. And then like other problems, we were, were, uh, we're, we're doing okay at solving it. Hmm. We're not there yet, but we've moved in the right direction in the last uh, 75 years or so. Finally, the, um, it is true that, that a lot of bad things happened when we became more sedentary, more crowded, but we can't think that infectious disease only began with, uh, with, with civilization, with agriculture, because we've got in, immune systems. Uh, we evolved immune systems precisely because uh, pathogens and parasites are a ubiquitous fact of, uh, of, all, of all living things. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, again, going back to the Rawlsian question of what society would you choose to be uh, parachuted into if you didn't know your, mm -hmm. your position? You know, again, I would not, I don't think I would pick being a, a peasant for most of human history. Uh, but if we look at just, say, longevity, we see that most hunter-gatherer societies, its life expectancy at birth, you know, kind of hovered in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Now, that, of course, is an average of a lot of kids dying and a lot of yeah. uh, with some some older adults. For that matter, that ceiling of about 30 years uh, held for a lot of human history. So it did hold a lot of um, agricultural societies. Mm -hmm. It only really began to shoot up in the second half of the 19th century uh, with advances in, in uh, public health and uh, late, later in, in the medicine. So uh, uh, while I, would, I kind of agree that for most of human history, um, settled societies were, uh, were, were no picnic, um, what we have in the last uh, century or so was, was, uh, was way better. And uh, yeah. even the Rawlsian choice, I would definitely choose to be born in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we agree there. The question though is, um, because, you know, the progress has all been so recent, right? Like the real genuine progress for most of humanity is all like, I, I think you, you're right when you say that. It's, it's basically really mostly been happening just after the Second World War, right? This extraordinary era of peace and progress. And then if you zoom out a little bit and look, really look at this on the world historical stage, then the question is, how sustainable is it really? And, and does it matter much, you know, if two mm. centuries from now we're in a very different place 
I'm often reminded of this this anecdote that a Chinese politician was asked in the 70s. Well, this probably never even happened, but like all good anecdotes, I'm still going <laughs> to tell it anyway. So, so the Chinese politician was asked, you know, what what do you think about uh, the French Revolution from 1789? Mm-hmm. And so the politician said, oh, that's, that's too early to say, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and and I, I, I always love that. I always love that because, and it's also a little bit the way I, how I look at civilization itself, this grand experiment that we started. Is it a good idea? Don't know yet. It's, it's been going well for the past 30 years, but I don't know. Uh, sometimes you look anxiously th- towards the future. Yeah, that was Cho and Lai that uh, to which that quote was attributed. I think he said it, although he probably didn't mean, as you know, he probably didn't mean what we interpreted, which is much. Yeah, better. exactly. He probably meant just the French student protests that were happening back then. <laughs> yeah. But yes, the um, certainly the the decline of interstate war is pretty recent. It's it's a process of the last seventy five years. There are other developments that were that are that are somewhat older. For example, the um, the general decline of interpersonal violence of, of, of highwaymen and brigands and, and uh, medieval warlords and, and uh, knights is a, a process that unfolded over uh, probably six or seven hundred years. Advancement of what we what we now call human rights, the abolition of sadistic corporal and capital punishment like breaking on the wheel and burning at the stake, probably around the time of the, the Enlightenment, the late, late 18th century, the abolition of slavery unfolded. Uh, over a period of about a, a century, uh, the, so there were some advances that are older than than uh, the, the decline of war, um, and, and still more recent are advancement of rights such as the um, uh, women's equality, gay rights, um, children. In terms of how easily redu- reversed they are, and I, I agree with Rutger that that's a, a critical question. Hmm. Looking at history, there, there's some some things that once they're abolished, they more or less stay abolished. Mm-hmm. Like uh, human sacrifice might be the best example. Mm-hmm. Practice probably in all ancient civilizations. We see the uh, discussions about uh, ending it in, in the Bible with a little bit of uh, backsliding. But by and large, you don't have um, a kind of a pendulum swinging. Should we should we sacrifice, throw a virgin into a volcano to to uh, as a way of dealing with a pandemic? Um, as, as, as crude as we are, we, we haven't gone back that way. Likewise, slavery as a legal institution, even though there's, of course, still human trafficking, but you don't get a move, backward movement where some s- states uh, decide to um, re-legalize chattel slavery. Now, Napoleon did it uh, after the French Revolution, so it's not that it's impossible, but there tends to be a big hmm. uh, push in that direction. So an open question is, uh, of all of these forces of progress, which ones can easily go back? And, and we know that things like violent crime can uh, seesaw. In the 1960s, there was a big uh, burst in violent crime. We know that there can be pushbacks against uh, democracy. We're, we're living through one now, although it has not come close to undoing the progress that we've made. Uh, wars could certainly break out again. Uh, others, though, tend to be, uh, I think, more difficult to reverse. Not that there's any mystical force of progress. I mean, that that that's a nonsensical notion. But just because when you, as long as there's some, some degree of accumulation of uh, of ideas, there's some mistakes that were you know, more or less resistant to making again. Yeah, yeah. I think you see the same in the history of the welfare state. So, for example, the the NHS is even being used by conservatives and by populists as a way to sort of slam the EU, right? <laughs> uh, so I think that as soon as as the US has Medicare for all, it will be almost impossible to get rid of for, for right-wing politicians because it will just be so popular and people will see it as a, as a right and they, they all take it for granted. I, I, I agree with that. And even in the United States, which notoriously uh, appears to resist any kind of... Um, uh, nationalized um, medicine, or for that matter, welfare state, the, the, the progress it, it seems almost inexorable. Even uh, an ultra-conservative like George W. Bush uh, mm-hmm. presided over an expansion of uh, Medicare for, for drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trump has tried to abolish Obamacare and failed several times. Uh, they, there can be uh, definitely regress, but I, I agree that, that the welfare state is probably unstoppable. 
uh, and in the United States, the direction, despite all of the, the, the populist pressures, still toward expansion. Before we end this section, we have our instalment known as Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher! So you're going to have a quotation from a philosopher from history. They've been dug up from the grave, they've been given the Frankenstein treatment, and uh, they've been able to record this very small clip for us. Uh, see if you can recognise this quotation. Men judge generally more by the eye than by the hand, for everyone can see and few can feel. Everyone sees what you appear to be. Few really know what you are. Mm. Any guesses who that might be? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I think you both quote him in your book, and I, I tried to find one which was semi-difficult. He has a but strange voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ollie, any guesses we did an episode on uh, him not it's, too long it's ago? It's either going to be Hobbes or Machiavelli, maybe? Yeah, it's Machiavelli. There you go. Very nice. I was going to give you some clues, such as he did most of his philosophizing after going to the pub unemployed with his friends. Uh, but no, he's, uh, it is Machiavelli. Uh, join us in next week's installment. We'll be continuing the conversation and asking some of your listener questions. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)